So um, again, welcome to the March Astro Quest from the Springfield Museums in Springfield, Massachusetts. My name's Kevin Kopchinski. I run the planetarium and astronomy programs here, as well as a few other things in STEM education. And I am joined tonight by Rich Sanderson, who is the president of the Springfield Stars Club, who meet here at, at this museum. So we have a, a nice program tonight. Rich is going to start off with some uh, uh, images uh, about the moon and uh, a, f a phenomenon called the Belt of Venus. And then we'll go to look at some happenings in the night sky. And we've got uh, sort of a twofer tonight, actually, part of our presentation. We're going to think about the Ides of March, because that's what it is today. Or is it? That's the question. Then, as I said, it's been about a little over a year since the Perseverance uh, rover has been up on Mars, so we're going to find out what it's been up to for that time and what, what they've been finding out. So uh, I'd like to get started and introduce Rich. Uh, again, Rich is the president of the Springfield Stars Club. Uh, Rich also was the curator of astronomy here for um, many years. What about, what, 17 years was it, Rich? Yeah, almost, just about 20. Tw almost 20, almost 20 years. Um, also, in addition, really, besides those 20 years, even well before that, Rich was associated with this museum and uh, worked here as a teenager as well. So, uh, I'd, Rich, maybe you'd like to say a little bit about the Stars Club, and then we can get to your images. The, the, the Science Museum, to me, is a second home. I think I was 15 years old when my mom brought me down there, and because I was driving her crazy during summer vacation from high school, and uh, and there was an article in the newspaper that said they, you know, they were shorthanded at the museum. And she said, I'm going to go over there with you and we're going to talk to the director and see if they they can put you to work. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. But uh, I began lecturing in the planetarium back when I was 15 years old, believe it or not. Uh, things were a little bit different back in those days in the 1970s. But, but anyways, um, as Kevin said, I'm the president of the Springfield Stars Club, which is a uh, an amateur astronomy club that has um, existed since 1934. A lot of astronomy clubs and amateur telescope making activities grew out of the Great Depression back in those days. And um, in 1934, a man named Carl Alsing um, founded the club. He was a, a refrigeration engineer at Westinghouse in Springfield. And he was eager to learn how to make a telescope and he did and other employees at Westinghouse said, you know, can you teach me? And enough people were interested that he said, well, we, sh we should form a club. And then, you know, in the beginning it met at people's homes, but eventually um, it got so large that um, it needed a, a, an institutional uh, venue for the, for the meetings. And at that time, Frank Corcus, the, the man who built the planetarium at the museum invited the club to help hold their meetings at the science museum. And, and they've been meeting there ever since then. And that was back in the 1950s. So the club uh, meets on the fourth Tuesday of every month from September through May. So it's one week after um, AstroQuest. So there'll be a meeting a week from tonight. And we did do a couple of Zoom meetings, but the meetings are have returned to being live meetings at the Science Museum. And most of the meetings, have a formal presentation, either a club member or an outside person uh, speaking about some aspect of popular astronomy. And I say popular because um, professional astronomy has a lot of calculus and mathematics and physics and all that. And it's, uh, it requires a lot of knowledge. But, but what we talk about at our meetings is popular astronomy. You don't need to know calculus or any of that. It's the fun part of astronomy for people that are interested, but um, you don't need a, a degree in, in math or physics or astronomy to enjoy the meetings. We generally have a guest speaker uh, for each of our meetings, but this month, um, this month's meeting a week from tonight at seven o'clock in the Tolman Auditorium, um, a gentleman named Jack Magus, who happens to be a planetarium educator at the Science Museum for many years and a longtime dear friend of mine, He's going to lead a, a program 
uh, kind of an audience participation program, which we do from time to time. And we're, he's going to have um, invite members to talk about their favorite astronomical adventure stories, like um, going traveling to see total eclipses of the sun or transits of Venus or tremendous meteor storms or comets, Halley's Comet, different things like that. Stories that people have from the past that they want to talk about, uh, members are going to take turns and it should be pretty fun. We've done programs like that in the past and it, it was a lot of fun. You never know what people are going to talk about, you know, what aspect of astronomy. So it's, um, it's always a, a pleasant surprise to hear these interesting stories and members that don't normally uh, like to stand behind the podium up front are more willing to share. And so a anybody can attend these meetings, even if you're not a member, you're welcome to come to the meeting and see if you like, uh, like the club enough to want to join. Um, if you become a member, it is $25 a year for members uh, of the Stars Club, but people are always welcome to come to a bunch of meetings, you know, half a dozen meetings and see if it's something for them uh, before making that decision. Uh, you don't need reservations. You don't have to pay a fee at the door or anything. You just show up at seven o'clock at the Tolman Auditorium and, and join us. And then if you like science or astronomy or, or space science or whatever, space exploration, I think you'd find the club quite interesting and, and rewarding. So. So anyways, that'll be our program uh, a week from tonight in the Tolman Auditorium. Um, and I guess uh, move to the images. Okay. Um, and I, I should mention, um, as Kevin's queuing up the pictures, um, at, at next month's AstroQuest, I, I'll be talking about a total lunar eclipse that's going to happen in May. And it so happens it, it's a day before it's Sunday night into Monday, so it's a day before the Astro Quest in May. So we're going to talk about it in April to get people uh, prepared for that event. And total lunar eclipses aren't extremely rare, but they're also not that common. I mean, you might see one every two, couple of years, every three years, depending on weather conditions and all that. So it's, it's something worth making an effort to see. And um, in April, I'll, I'll talk about what causes a lunar eclipse, how to observe it, what time it's going to happen, how, how the moon's going to look. I'll show some pictures of other eclipses I've seen over the years. And, uh, and it's a pretty neat event to see a uh, total eclipse like that. So that'll be next month. But for, for this evening, I just thought I'd just show a few pictures that I've taken um, since last month's AstroQuest. Um, there's always something interesting to see in the sky. You never know exactly what you're going to see and that's what makes astronomy so interesting and it's not always nighttime um, sometimes you see interesting things in the heavens um, during the daytime connected to celestial objects or, or even during twilight and to, to me twilight is is one of the most beautiful times of day you know it's about a half hour or 45 minutes um, after the sun sets before the sky is totally dark and it's just a surrealistic kind of a mystical time you know when they see these beautiful colors in the sky and the stars begin to appear and, and there are a variety of, of phenomena that can appear during twilight and one of the more beautiful ones that happens fairly often it's it's not too rare um, it's it's called the belt of venus and I saw an example of that um, in February, and I got some pictures of it. And it's, it's always a challenge, you know, when you see something like this happening in the sky to find a, a location. It's good to have kind of in the back of your mind some locations where there's not houses and telephone and electrical wires and everything uh, cr crisscrossing your, your image. So what I do is I go to the local uh, elementary school here in Feeding Hills and, and go out in the field behind the school and there's a low horizon. You can get some nice pictures that way without any obstructions. And so the belt of Venus is, is actually the edge of the Earth's shadow and it appears right after the sun sets. So the sun goes down below the horizon. The sun is gone for maybe five minutes or so and the sky is darkening gradually and, and you may see a, a pink band of light uh, begin to rise in the eastern sky opposite the sun. So the sun sets in the west and this band of pink rises in the east. 
Now, this is not the same as the red glow that shines on clouds sometimes around the sunset area. When the sun goes down, it may color the clouds orange or red or, or yellow. But this is in the opposite direction of the sun. And as the sun goes down, the belt of Venus comes up and it's a band of pink um, that, that straddles the eastern horizon. And that's basically the sunlight skimming through the atmosphere. And, and when the sunlight skims through the atmosphere, it's going through many miles of air because it's skimming across the edge of, of the earth right at that instant. And when sunlight passes through air, the air that we breathe, some of the light gets scattered. And, and because of the physics of light waves and, and how, how they interact with particles in the atmosphere, it turns out that the blue end of the spectrum, blue light gets scattered much easier than red light. So what it does when that light comes through the atmosphere, the blue light is subtracted from the sun and it scatters all over the place to create a blue sky. That's why our sky is blue during the day, scattered sunlight, really scattering it's called. And so if you subtract the blue out of the sun's light, you're left with reddish or pinkish glow. And that's the glow that you see as the band of Venus or the belt of Venus rising in the sky. And you can see it in that picture along the horizon and, and right below it, you can see kind of a darker portion of sky just along the tree line there. And that's actually the Earth's shadow. And that'll be the, the shadow that extends through space that's gonna hit the moon in May and the moon's gonna be engulfed in that shadow. But in this picture, you're seeing the Earth's shadow in the Earth's atmosphere, darkening the Earth's atmosphere a little bit as the sun goes down. And this, this belt of Venus Earth shadow phenomena lasts only about 15, 20 minutes at the most. Um, it's a, a fairly uh, short-lived phenomena. So, um, but, but it happens quite often. The next picture I, I believe is a, a diagram. There we go, that kind of shows what I, what I just explained that there's the earth and, and that black line going across the middle, that's the horizon. So if you're standing right at the top of the earth in this diagram, that black line is the horizon. So anything above it you can see and anything below it is, is below the horizon you can't see. So to the left, you can see that the sun has set, it's below the horizon, you can't see the sun, but the sunlight is still skimming through air in the upper atmosphere, because even if we're in darkness, the upper atmosphere may be still bathed in sunlight. And that sunlight skims the atmosphere and it projects through the air. You see that pinkish glow, the belt of Venus and the Earth's shadow, as you can see the shadow of the Earth is just slightly above the horizon to the far right. And that's uh, what you saw in my picture. And the next slide shows the photo I took with um, just with the belt of Venus and the shadow identified just to make sure that everybody understands what I'm talking about. Um, notice how the Earth's shadow is, is kind of a little bit darker grayish uh, blue than, than the blue sky at the top of the picture. This was a, a, a particularly uh, nice display uh, of the belt of Venus. Of, and, and it shows up better when there's a lot of um, any, any impurities in the atmosphere, like from wood stove smoke on a cold day or perhaps fog or haze or whatever. The atmosphere becomes sort of a three-dimensional projection screen. And, and that haze uh, allows you to see that pink belt going through the air. So. Um, that's that's a, a interesting phenomena, something to look for any any time uh, you're outdoors right after sunset. And the next um, group of pictures are some shots of the moon, I, I believe. I saw the beautiful crescent moon and it just drew me outside. I hauled one of my telescopes outside just to take a look at it. This, this is a, a waxing crescent moon which means it's uh, less than half illuminated, but it's waxing means it's growing more and more illuminated every night. And that happens as the moon orbits around the earth about approximately once a month. And the word month and moon come from the same root word because the moon takes about a, a month to orbit the earth one time. And as it goes around the earth, the angle between the earth, the moon and the sun continuously changes and it and the crescent phase changes from night to night because of that changing angle. So it goes from a new moon where it's um, almost aligned with the sun to a first quarter moon when it's at a 90 degree angle. And a new moon is when the, the earth is between 
the sun and the moon and the entire moon is illuminated. But this is a waxing crescent. And this is a good time uh, to look at the moon through a telescope because the, the portion of the moon where the light part of the moon meets the dark in the, in the middle of the moon there, that, that boundary line is called the terminator. And if you are on the moon, that's where the sun is rising. Now, now sunrise on the moon is very slow because a, a day on the moon is, is about a month long as well. The moon is in a captured orbit and it rotates and revolves around the earth at the same rate once a month. So, so it's a very gradual sunrise on the moon. And that's why from night to night that, that terminator gradually creeps across the moon. And any craters that are located along that shadow really stand out in stark relief because anything that's casting a shadow is gonna show up better. The shadow renders it easily visible. And you can see along that, that shadow, and there'll be some close-up pictures, you can see how those craters and mountains just, just jump right out at you. You can see very fine detail. And every night, you know, you look at the moon, the Terminator's in a slightly different position and there's different craters right there along the edge. It's a, just a beautiful uh, changing uh, panorama on the moon from night to night. Yeah, I'm looking right here in the middle, Rich. Uh, you've got that one crater. It's got a mountain in the middle and that mountain is lit up, but the crater floor is still pretty much in shadow. That's right. They just got and, and on the moon, the shadows are jet black because there's no atmosphere to scatter any light on the moon. So, you know, on, on the Earth, you know, during at sunrise, you know, you can see shadows because the light's being scattered around. But on the moon, a shadow is, is jet black until the sun finally hits it. And so you sometimes see pinpoints of light. And, and here you can see a better one, a better view of that along that terminator on the upper left. Look at all the the little white specks, those are all mountain peaks and their edges of craters that are higher elevation than the surrounding landscape on the moon. So there, the sun is hitting those peaks, but the at the base of, of those mountains and craters is still immersed in darkness. And I should say these pictures were taken with a an eight inch telescope that I made a long time ago. I made it for Halley's Comet back in the eighties. Um, and, and I took these just by holding my iPhone up to the eyepiece. And it's possible to get really good pictures with an iPhone and, and it was handheld. Some You can get brackets to hold the iPhone, but I, I, ju I just spent a half hour outdoors and took some quick shots, you know, and I handheld the phone. And, you know, it takes a little bit of practice and hand-eye coordination, you know, to, to be able to do it. It can be kind of frustrating at first, but once you get used to it and, and you know you develop that skill it's fairly easy to get decent pictures of the moon rapidly you know with just an iphone right up to the eyepiece and and that's how i took this and look look at all the the, the mountain in that crater and all those other craters right on the terminator and the last picture um of the moon that's my my favorite one down in the southern highlands of the moon where there's um a lot of craters and a lot of detail and it's just a a real busy crowded area of the moon. It's an ancient lunar landscape with craters there that have been building up, you know, for tens and hundreds of millions of years, billions of years. And, and on the moon, like I said, there's no atmosphere to scatter light. And that means there's no atmosphere or water running water or anything to erode craters. So, so if a rock from space, an asteroid or a meteoroid crashes into the moon and leaves a crater behind you know that crater might stay there for 500 million years you know unless another asteroid scores a direct hit on it um there, there's micro meteoroids little tiny specks of rock floating in space that hit the moon and little by little they wear away at craters and mountains but it's a very very slow process nothing like here on earth um, with all the erosion from our wind and atmosphere and weather and water, nothing like that on the moon. So you're you're seeing a surface that in some areas is billions, billions of years old, much older than the Earth's surface. I love that speck right on the far lower left, right on the cusp of the moon at the bottom of the picture, you can see one detached point of light, a, a probably a mountain peak, or maybe the central peak in a crater that just happens to be you know, maybe a mile or, or half a mile higher than the surrounding 
landscape that's all immersed in shadow and it's just like a little pinpoint of light glowing. You might think it's a star, but that's a, a feature on the moon. So this this gives you an idea of what you can do with a you know a relatively you know moderate sized backyard telescope and just an iPhone um, and a little bit of practice. Th this was a a totally unexpected thing. I was in in my home. Uh, I, I didn't put the date on. It was a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, up, upstairs and early in the morning, and the sun was rising, and I. I noticed uh, an ellipse, an oval, glowing oval of sunlight on the carpet in my hallway of the second floor. And I immediately realized it's a pinhole image of the sun. And believe it or not, you don't need a, a lens to form an image like you have in a camera. A camera has a lens, a telescope has a lens that forms an image, but you can form an image just with a pinhole with no optics at all, just a pinhole through something. And, and sunlight shining through. And what it turned out to be is in my, my daughter's bedroom, um, we still have an air conditioner in the window and there was a shade down and it was a little tiny triangular opening in the window that was maybe a, an eighth of an inch across or smaller. And the sun happened to be rising in the right angle. So the sunlight was beaming right through that little pinhole in, in my daughter's bedroom window. And it was lined up so that it came out through her bedroom door and it went down in the hallway about 15 or 20 feet. And so I ran down and got a piece of paper and held it in the right angle so you'd see a circular image. And again, that's without any lens whatsoever, no optics, no telescope, just a pinhole. And that's the sun's disc right there projected on a piece of paper. That's, that's the actual sun. If, if there was an eclipse going on, partial eclipse, you'd see a crescent right there. But that's the entire sun formed by a pinhole. And some, some photographers even enjoy taking pinhole photographs. I've heard that they get like a metal can, like the size of a paint can, and put a pinhole in one end and film opposite. And it might take a half hour to do the exposure because it's not much light is coming through. And you can get a, a photograph that way. It's not r crystal clear like you would get with a lens. It's a little fuzzy. But as you can see there, that's not bad of an image of the sun and it's a safe way to look at eclipses. I think the next picture shows a diagram of using a pinhole to do an eclipse, um, to look at an eclipse. And here, here I, I showed a person holding a, a piece of cardboard with a pinhole poked in it. And, you know, it's maybe a 16th of an inch across. That's all the hole has to be. If the hole is too big, the image gets fuzzy and you don't see anything. And if there's a partial eclipse of the sun, you can hold a, a cardboard up with a pinhole punched in it and let the sunlight shine onto a, a second white piece of cardboard, which is like a movie screen. And there you see a little tiny image of the sun projected right onto the cardboard. And that's safe because you're not looking at the sun, you're looking at a projected image of the sun. And um, there's no solar eclipse coming anytime soon, but I just thought I'd throw that in after seeing that pinhole image in the hallway. And the next picture is my final one. It shows um, what pinhole images uh, of the eclipse can look like. And it's always fascinating when you see a pinhole image that happens by accident. You know, you can create a, a pinhole projector or a pinhole camera, you know, by, by building it yourself. But sometimes you see pinhole images like I did in my hallway just by accident. And I took this picture way back in 1984, when there was an annular eclipse of the sun where the moon passed in front of the sun. The moon wasn't quite big enough to cover the entire sun. So the sun was a complete uh, ring of dots of sunlight shining through valleys on the moon. It was, it was a complete eclipse for only four seconds because the moon and the sun appeared exactly the same size in the sky. It was a hybrid eclipse, it's called. But right after the maximum phase of the eclipse, when the eclipse was at the phase that you see in the picture on the right, which I snapped uh, right before I took the picture on the left, you see the phase of the eclipse right there, a thin, thin crescent sun with the moon in front. And the picture on the left is below a tree. That's the hood of my, my old Chevy Impala, 78 Chevy Impala that I had um, way back then. And, that, and it was parked beneath a tree. And the leaves and the branches on the tree, um, there were like little spaces that formed pinhole projectors just by accident 
of the sunlight shining through the tree onto the hood of my car. And if you look, you see hundreds of little crescent suns all over. All, all that light on my car is made up of hundreds and hundreds of little crescent suns superimposed on each other by all the little holes in the tree. And again, it's an image of the eclipse made just by random pinholes amongst the branches and the leaves. I just think that's uh, the most fascinating. I, w I wish I had gotten a complete circular images of the sun, but I was busy photographing it directly at that point, but I'm, I'm glad I got that thin crescent image projected on the hood of my car. And uh... All right, so there's a comment on, I'm gonna go back to the, I'm gonna go back a couple of pictures here. There's a comment that uh, you got even, it, there's a little bit of a projection onto your hand. Uh, in the comments, yeah, right the, the, the glow around the sun. If yeah, if I overexpose that picture, you would actually see clouds, or you might see tree branches. Even it, it, in the olden days, they called it a camera obscura, where they would have a shed or a room in a house or a shed in the backyard, totally dark, and have a pinhole where an image would come in, and it would fill the whole wall with, with an image projected by the pinhole or or by a lens, and so. This was like a, a camera obscura inside my house by accident. So I underexposed it so that you could see how sharp the sun's disc is in this picture. But in some cases, you know, when you're looking at it, you see clouds drifting in front. You might see branches or even an airplane flying in front of the sun or a bird flying in front, uh, you know, just like a, a motion picture projected onto that piece of paper. Thanks. Thanks, Rich. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the yep, the yep. There was I uh, put a comment in there. Yeah, the pinhole pinhole cameras were were a big deal once upon a time. Uh, people using those to get and some yeah, and as you say, some folks still do it today. Uh, okay, so um, we'll move on and and uh, look at sort of events in in the night sky um, coming up over the next month or so. And before we get into that, I I had that. Uh, you know, at the beginning, this idea what the Ides of March, right? And so this is March 15th, and it's the Ides of March. But what if we had someone from ancient Rome here somehow teleported into the present, and we told them that today was the Ides of March? Well, they'd take a one look at the sky and tell you, no, Ides of March isn't for a couple of days yet, right? Because this tradition coming from ancient Rome, they had a lunar calendar. They marked their months by the moon. And so the middle of the month was the full moon. The Ides were the middle of the month. And that was, that was a full moon. Uh, and as long as it's not cloudy, it's pretty obvious for anyone to see. The new moon, however, was a lot more tricky because technically you can't see the real, the actual full moon, um, I'm sorry, the actual new moon, because at the time of the new moon, we're, the, the side of the moon that we see is totally in shadow. And so it, it would be, it, it would be uh, dark and you'd be looking in the same direction as the sun is in the sky and the sky would be bright, so you can't see it. But that was the beginning of the month, and it was pretty important for them to know when the beginning of the month is, and that had a name, the beginning of the month. And that name is related to a common timekeeping technology that we use today. They call that, the beginning of the month was called the Kalends, and that's where we get our word calendar. And it was actually the job of uh, someone, some high priests in Rome to kind of keep track of that last crescent and more or less declare when the, when the Kalends occurred so that people know that it was the start of the month. So um, it, it's, it, it's not really the Ides of March today. But anyway, um, Rich, there's a question in the chat. Uh, uh, where do you get a bracket that you can hold your iPhone over the lens? Yeah, I was just um, looking up the website. Uh, I have a bracket that I sometimes use, um, and I purchased it from Orion Telescope and Binoculars uh, Company, uh, which is out in California. 
Uh, they have a website. It's um, telescope.com, telescope.com, and they have a, a bracket that hook. Um, I think there's a, two or three different styles, different prices um, to hold your your. Um, it, it basically you put the eyepiece in it and the camera lens is right over the eyepiece and it, it attaches them together so there's no jiggling and then you put it into the telescope. The only thing I would warn people is that there's like little clamps that hold your camera tight and if you tighten it too much you can pop the seal on your phone which I did on mine and I'd have it fixed and allowed moisture to get into my into the phone and my camera lens was fogged on the inside because of that so don't over tighten it. So you can use that bracket to hold the camera steady. You know, obviously if you're pushing the little button on it to take pictures, it's gonna jiggle everything. So you don't wanna do that either. And a, a trick, um, in the olden days, we use release cables that we put on cameras to take time exposures. And you can do that with an iPhone by getting a, um, a, a earbuds uh, on, that are uh, not, not wireless, but wired earbuds that you have to plug into your phone. And when you plug earbuds into the phone, and you turn your phone onto your camera app to take pictures, the, the uh, volume button on the earbuds tr triggers the shutter. So you put the earbuds in and, and, and as if you're increasing the volume in the earbuds, when you have it on the camera setting, it clicks the shutter on your camera so you can hold that wire and you're not jiggling the camera by pushing the, the exposure button. Yeah, it really is an acquired skill to uh, do that by hand uh without with without that bracket um it, but it it can be it's it's probably not for folks who've had a lot of coffee right ahead <laughs> or, or ones that get frustrated easily i mean or, uh, or yeah i uh, be prepared to do lots of practice my, my last <laughs> word on that is i've probably done that you know 500 times and, and i i throw away probably uh 49 out of every 50 pictures i take you know keep the, the few best ones and a lot there's a lot of bad ones because it's just difficult to do that easy to uh pretty easy to do though it's uh well pretty inexpensive anyway to take those pictures once you have the camera okay so let's we'll go ahead and start taking a look at uh, uh stuff happening in the sky and one thing i do want to mention as we um as as i get the night sky program going here that it really helps if you have the room darkened uh, that where you're looking at this program now, if you can get your screen shaded or get uh, get the lights or, and definitely not have light shining on the screen, um, it, it really helps you to see what's going on here. So we are using a program called Stellarium. Stellarium is a free program that's available for any computer and it's basically a simulated planetarium. It will show you, you can set the uh, location. You might be able to read down in the corner here, it says Springfield, uh, you can, so you can set it for any location. Uh, you, can, you can set it for any time and date. I'm actually gonna pause the time there and see, what, see what's going on or what was going on or what will be going on in the sky, depending for when you uh, set the date, and it's pretty accurate going backwards for uh, a few thousand years, actually, or forwards for a few thousand years. Uh, great, it's a, it's a just a great resource to use. So, so here we are. We're looking. You can see the W. You're looking to the south. As we look to the west at the onset of darkness, well, now it gets dark at eight o'clock, eight fifteen. The sun the sun is going down right before seven o'clock now. So you have to wait a good hour, at least an hour and a quarter, to be start to seeing a lot of stars in the sky. And as we look to the west, now we're starting to see in the west, there is Taurus, that V-shape, and just sort of now below and to the right is the Pleiades. And uh, we were, we've been sort of watching them all since the fall. They first appeared during the fall in the east. And, They've slowly, as we watch in the evening sky, they've slowly made their way across the sky, and, and now they're uh, in, high in the western sky, and we're going to be sort of seeing them go um, over the next uh, couple of months. 
as we bring in as we bring in other stars. So that's sort of a sort of showing the passing of the seasons. If we move to the south, then we pick up, or actually just the, still the southwest. We're still pretty significantly wet. The south is over on the corner of the screen. In the southwest, we're getting Orion and uh, and and his entourage. Uh, Orion there, this the, the hunter, uh, the outline fairly looking like maybe the outline of a person. He's got stars on his shoulders, stars down on the knees, a belt of three stars on his waist, Orion's belt. Uh, and in the Greek and Roman stories, he's a hunter. And uh, so what do hunters have with them along on the hunt? Very often hunting dogs, right? So we need a dog for the uh, for the hunter, and we've got a bunch of bright stars right behind him, so folks made a dog there. There's enough stars sometimes that I like to think it kind of looks like a goofy-looking dog. Um, there's the nose. There's the eye. Dog's got a long neck, sort of a giraffe dog, a couple little legs, and a little bit of a tail. And I think it's really important to understand that the ancient people, when they were doing this, they were not really making pictures. Constellations are not intended to be connected dots. They were making a way to understand and remember the night sky, because the night sky, that was the original calendar, at least as far as tracking the seasons and being prepared and ready for the seasons. It, the, the only way to do a lunar calendar is, is going to be very difficult to keep that in, in tune with the seasons. We're, we're so used to our calendar where we actually have the equinox coming up uh, on the 20th this month. We can look at the calendar and we can see where we are in relation to the changing of the seasons, maybe by flipping a page or two on the calendar, but we can see that very easily, and we take that so for granted, but that's only been like that for maybe about 800 years or so, and before that, it was very hard, it was very hard to look at a date and understand exactly where you were in the, in the passing of the seasons, but the stars did it for folks, the stars were, were that calendar, and anything they could do to remember, correctly identify the stars was a, a very important thing. So anyway, yeah, it's a, really a funny looking dog. And then as I always like to joke, well, yeah, you think that's a bad dog? Well, here's the little dog up here. And that's it. There's just two stars and nothing else. There's the, there's the hunter. There's one bright star behind him. This star here in the little dog is the next brightest star there is out behind the hunter. Um, the star is called Procyon. That means before the dog. You notice this star is higher in the sky. It rises before the dog star does. So Procyon before the dog, and there's there's your little dog. So that entourage is slowly moving to the west. And if you go out at the fall of darkness over the weeks, you'll see that happening. And then as we get over to the um, east and southeast. And let's look at the moon here. I, they don't do a really great job of this, and I don't have a lot of the information turned on. I don't think it's quite a full moon yet, but it's, get, it's really, it is really close. Um, so it's maybe only a day away from the eyes. Uh, so there's, there's our moon, and the moon is just below um, the constellation Leo. Leo has now cleared the horizon. Uh, there's the front of Leo, the lion. Uh, the bright star Regulus is in his chest, the roundness for his head. There's a, uh, well, there's the two stars back here on the back end and the tail. So there's sort of a body in here and a head and a body. I like to think that it's a crouching lion because the legs are tucked under and we can't see them, although it's usually depicted in art with, with all, you know, with legs and it's moving or whatever. 
I think in February we mentioned we could just see the head of Leo on the horizon at the beginning of February as showing us that winter and now that he has well cleared the horizon, we are on our way to the spring equinox on the 20th. And one thing we can do is to look toward um, the north and the northeast. There's our Big Dipper also has cleared the horizon. Remember when that was really down along the horizon and uh, very difficult to see perhaps because of trees and buildings. Now it has cleared the horizon, moving up, uh, up the northern sky. And if we look at the handle, and we have a little bit of a curve to this handle, well, another word for a curve is an arc. And right now um, that it's a little later in the evening, we can cur curve around this arc. We say follow the arc to Arcturus. That should be it. Sure enough, it is. Um, Arcturus. The brightest star in the constellation Boltes, the herdsman, and this when you can arc to Arcturus in the early evening, and especially right at the onset of darkness, when you can arc to Arcturus, that is a sure sign of spring. Uh, Shakespeare wrote about that as a sign of spring. I uh, know that's something that I've always looked for uh, to really say that hey, you know, we are getting to the end of winter. Um, although we certainly had the weather for it, right? Um, or we're going to have the weather for it this week to tell us that we're getting to the end of winter. But weather can be a quirky thing. You know, we could still get a snowstorm. Uh, so anyway, there's, uh, there we are. And then just to finish it off, I guess, if we do the Big Dipper, we can't go without mentioning the Little Dipper. If we take the two stars on the bowl, follow them across, we find the North Star. And then... Um, there's still a little brightness in the sky or in this depiction of the sky. And, but this is, you know what, this is the way it is. Okay, there are some stars in here that make up a handle for the Little Dipper. There's two stars over here that make up the back end of the bowl, but those are really faint. And in a suburban or urban situation where you've got lights and a lot of light pollution, this, the middle part of the Little Dipper just fades away. And it's very hard to see. So this is sort of what you really, really, really might see there. Um, and then I noticed there is um, that line of stars. If you wonder about that line of stars under, that's the tail of Draco the dragon. Uh, that, that's what's out there. And, and we can uh, take a look at and what do we have to look forward to? Well, we definitely, you know, will see Arcturus clearing the uh, horizon more and more. Um, let's bring in the uh, dates here, and all right, so I actually I'm, we're on the 18th here, not the uh, not the 15th. As we move ahead over the rest of the month and into April, then not only do we see we can arc to Arcturus, but let's see, I think so, we can arc to Arcturus and then speed on to Spica. Yes. Okay, so this is part of the constellation Virgo, and boy, Virgo is one that, um, this is one that just doesn't look like what it's supposed to be, um, especially when it's low in the sky. So again, when you can speed on the Spica, and uh, speed on to, uh, Arc to Arcturus and speed on the Spica, fall is on the way, and then Spica, the height of Spica above the horizon at the fall of darkness was an indicator of when to plant. Right now, it's way too low, right? And as we now know with our modern calendars, um, what, what is that, the early April? Early April is, is too early for many things. There's still some danger of frost. We, we need to see it higher in the sky before, uh, before we plant our crops. And there's the six. So the next, our next astro quest is on the, um, uh, on the 19th of April. And it, let's see, so the early in April, let's move back by early, yeah, by early April, the uh, moon returns to the sky, to the night sky as a crescent moon. And maybe we'll even back up a couple, yeah, look at this on the 4th. You've got a crescent moon right below the Pleiades in the evening. Uh, that's about quarter, 20 after 8 in the evening. 
Uh, and that's going to be, again, at the fall. It's actually, look at that, it's kind of still twilight there on the horizon. As if you go at the same time, each day the moon will appear to move across the sky a little bit. So it's going to move among all the Taurus and all these uh, bright constellations. And I believe it moves, if we shift our view upwards a little bit above Taurus, is uh, the two star or are the two stars of Gemini. And uh, we'll see the moon moving up towards those by the 8th. So that's, uh, that's something uh, maybe to look forward to early, early next month. Now, you might be asking, hey, what about the planets, right? Well, for planets, we're going to have to move to the morning. So by the end of the month, we have a crescent. This, now, remember, we are now 5 o'clock in the morning, right, before dawn, and we see the crescent moon rising right before dawn, and we've got just really low in the sky. We've got some planets down there. If we move this a little bit ahead into um, April, we see they get a little bit higher. So the really big one, that which is bright, supposed to indicate brightness, that is Venus. And then we've got Saturn and Mars. Okay, Jupiter will be along probably after, pretty much after our next astral quest, um, Jupiter will be along in the sky as well, uh, into the morning sky. So planets are going to be a morning thing for a while. It's not only a morning thing, but a thing where uh, you're going to need a very, very clear eastern horizon uh, to see those. So if you're lucky enough to know where that is, and um, the nice thing with the clocks changing is that the Sunrise has gotten later, and it, you don't have to get up that early. Maybe 518 isn't awfully early uh, to get up and, and, and see something. So those are, so there we go. There's some of our night, our events um, happening in, in the night sky. I thought also we would take a, we haven't in uh, recent AstroQuests taken a look for the International Space Station. So I thought maybe we'd just take a peek at, at how to do that. We haven't reviewed that in a while. Um, just refresh here and see. So if you go to this site, Heavens Above, Heaven, I'll get the H in there, heavensabove.com, you get on there, they give you a graphic of where the station is at the moment. And then if you click on ISS, Oh, first, you check to be sure that your location is right. Okay, your location should be something like 42 degrees and 72 degrees, 42 degrees latitude, 72 longitude. Um, it should be something like that. If it's not, you click this and you get to a map where you can punch your position in on the map. Okay, and then once you know your position is right, then, then you click on ISS and you get an ad. Um, then you click on ISS and you get this chart. As you look at the chart, the chart is basically giving you a date and then it's telling you where you start to see the space station, what its highest point will be, and then where it sort of sets. So kind of like where does the station rise, where does the station set, and what is its highest point. And so the things to scan, oh, and the brightness over here, so the things to scan are the highest point, altitude. And the higher it is, the bigger the number is. It's a number from uh, 0 to 90. Uh, zero's right on the horizon. 90 is straight over your head. So here on the 17th, we see that it's going to be about two-thirds of the way up in the sky. So there's going to be no trees or buildings blocking this one, right? And looking at the brightness, the more negative a brightness is, the brighter the object is. Okay, for whatever reasons, when they started the brightness scale, they kind of did it backwards. And uh, so the, the, smaller, the, the smaller the number, uh, the brighter the object is. So this is 3 point, minus 3.8 is really bright, and it'll be very high above the horizon. Um, we see another one coming up on the 19th at 50 degrees above the horizon and a minus 3. Honestly, a minus 2 is still pretty bright, 
although it's only 11 degrees above the horizon. 11 degrees is, 10 degrees is if you put your fist out at arm's length. I get this right on the camera here. You put your fist out at arm's length, and 10 degrees is the top of your fist. Um, it, it, you put the bottom of your fist on the horizon. 10 degrees is about the top of your fist, held at arm's length. So that 11 degrees, that's kind of low. Something could block, be blocking you, but now you've got 80 degrees. 80 degrees might be a little bit of a neck ache. You're almost looking straight over your head. But you get the idea. You can take a look, and then you notice the times. And we're looking at evening appearances, and actually it looks like we're going to need fairly bright appearances because at 7.30, it's not totally dark yet, 7.34. Um, the sun has set, but it's not totally dark. But a minus 3.6, that'll show up. That'll, that'll show up in a dust sky, no problem. So uh, get out and enjoy, um, enjoy uh, looking, looking for the station as well. Those are uh, sort of some sky events. And we'll go ahead and uh, move, move on to uh, think about the Perseverance uh, rover. Yeah, there's good old Earth. And we are now using a program called Open Space. Um, this program is also um, free. Uh, it is available technically for any computer, although it seems like if you're having a little trouble, I, last I heard, getting to work on Macs. And you do have to be kind of a geek to get it to run on Linux. But it, again, technically, yeah, it is available for any computer. But I say that with a little hesitation because that computer that you're trying to use has to be a pretty powerful computer, especially for the um, graphics card, the video card. It, it's, this, is a, this is basically a three-dimensional simulation taking together, in this case, we're still looking at the Earth, we're taking um, images of the Earth from yesterday and stitching them together, and we can kind of see the stitching sometimes there, uh, stitching them together, and as we move the Earth, it displays to us the different images so that we can get the sense that we're moving around the Earth. Well, we can do that not just with the Earth, but we can do that with um, Mars. Uh, we can do that with any of the planets in the solar system, but Mars especially. And I say that just because... The cameras that are orbiting Mars and the cameras that are on Mars on the rovers are just spectacular. They, they just have such great resolution. They, they really bring, bring things to life. So now we're arriving at Mars. All right, see, I, I see that comment there flashing up. Um, a computer good for gaming would also be good for this. Yes, yes. Uh, because you're basically using the same powers of that gaming computer, uh, 3D graphics rendering. And, and that's the thing, to get a good graphics card for a computer, that can be, that, a really good graphics card can be several hundred dollars right there. And yes, I am using, I'm using a gaming class laptop to do this, and I'm not sure if it comes across the audio, but the fan on this thing has been working overtime for the last 15 minutes um, to, to, crank out, to, to crank out the power of this program. So again, we're, we're looking over Mars and we're getting imagery from the satellites that have orbited Mars over the years and still orbiting Mars. And again, it's sort of stitched together into this image that makes it uh, you know, look as if we're orbiting and we're seeing this, uh, you know, this in sort of real time. The other thing is, too, what's interesting about this program, again, there's been lots of, and this could be interesting to look at for a bit, actually. Uh, the cameras don't just do, uh, you know, regular visual light, so to speak, um, although they do that quite well, but they also... Um, use other wavelengths, and then the cameras, there's also radar that gives you height information. And that information is put together sort of in color-coded maps 
the, and the, in this program, it is possible to sort of activate these different data channels. So let's go ahead and do that for a moment. There we go. So now we've got some height coded information. We're going to actually back away a little bit. There's really no right side up on Earth, and I think for once, I've come into Mars with the South Pole up and the North Pole down because this very low area, so the low areas are uh, blue, higher areas are the orange and, and uh, red, and into the yellows, and green is sort of uh, median. So let's bring us around to what I think is the right orientation. And it's very suggestive that they've colored this blue because, you know, you think of water. And in fact, with this being a lower area, it is, in fact, possible that this area was covered in water billions of years ago. This is the picture that scientists have built up about, um, uh, about Mars that that they think it was covered in water that long ago. Here we go. There's, I think that's Jezero right, right there. And then we need to bring in some more data of higher res, higher res data, uh, higher resolution. So now we're seeing uh, higher res uh, imagery that's been taken by, um, by these satellites. There we go. Oh, and yep, I left the labels on. Yep, there it is. Okay, there's Jezero. Uh, Jezero is named after a town in Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, that, whose name means lake. Because let's take a look at this from, uh, very quickly from a bird's eye point of view. That as we look at this crater, and off to the side of the crater, we have this snaking valley that looks for all the world like a river and there's uh, a low point in the rim of the crater and it again coming in a little more it looks for all the world like water has poured in and left a deposit a delta deposit here and over in this area is where the perseverance set down and, and the idea was to explore this area in more depth and try to learn about, is this really a river delta, uh, and get some samples from the area. So um, I'm going to go ahead, we're going to go ahead and abandon this. Um, again, we'll just get that bird's eye view, and then we will look at a couple of pictures from, we'll end up with just a couple of pictures real quickly from the Perseverance uh, rover itself, right? We sent we sent a small helicopter. It's sort of is it a small helicopter? Or is it, it's re really big for a drone. It's about four feet wide, maybe about a foot or so, a uh, four foot long, about a foot or so wide. So it's a that would be really big for a drone. Of course, it's still really small for a helicopter. So this is a picture of it taking its sh it's a picture of its shadow as it's flying around. Uh, around on Mars, and there are there. This is a picture that it has taken from the air, and it's going to turn out to be very useful to get these aerial shots as the um, as the rover goes around its business. So here's that delta deposit in close up. That's where it's set down, and it's been exploring around this area. Um, it kind of uh, came around this way, and then it actually came back. And I believe they're trying to figure out how to get it to head up towards the scarps. These are, this is the actual delta area. It's about a, almost two miles away at this point, but they want to get close to that to really sample it. But in a way, they've been able to get close to it. First of all, uh, just here's a schematic. Rivers come in. Uh, seasonally, you get a higher flow and lower flow, and as the deltas deposit, they layer up. And as we get some close-up pictures from the uh, uh, from that orbit, let's get rid of the space station there. Uh, as we get close-up pictures, 
there's one of those scarps. I think this one, yeah, this one is the one called Kodiak, if you saw that. And look at the layering in those rocks. These rocks, this looks for all the world like layers of rocks that have been laid down by, um, uh, by a river delta. And there's the, uh, the, the edge of the crater out behind it there. And okay, there's another one, uh, one of the different scarps. Again, a lot of rubble has fallen down, but there's, um, there is wind on Mars, by the way. Uh, there's, again, some layering on that one. And then uh, closer by, these rocks are thought to be volcanic rocks, actually, lava flow rocks. These, this is right next to it. Those other pictures were maybe from over a mile away. Um, I will put, we'll uh, finish up, we'll take a look at a couple of websites that you can look at. I will put them into the chat. Uh, there we go. So there is the... Uh, where is the rover? Um, and let's, we can back off a little bit. So there's the delta deposit. And they're showing us, so why is it fuzzy over here, bright over there, or detailed over there? Because the high resolution camera is not wide angle. It takes very, very uh, narrowly, uh, narrow pictures, and it just didn't, it didn't image over there. It imaged right here where you know where where they wanted to put this down so we can see it kind of landed as i said it went around explored came back um and is now heading is they're going to head it over there um oh yeah where i want to get that and drop it into the chat for you all real quickly okay there, that, there it goes and we can if we zoom in with this the resolution is just phenomenal between the rover and that scarp, see all this stuff, this stripy stuff? This is all sand dunes. And the rover's going to get stuck in those. And, and see, here's, here's the uh, helicopter out on a scouting flight. Um, so they've got to figure out how to negotiate this, this band of sand dunes that stands between them and over that way where uh over to the left where where the actual delta is um so again you can it shows you where it's been each circle is where it stopped for uh, uh stopped driving for a while sometimes it stayed in the same place for a while uh there you go there's a couple of fun things that maybe um that that you can get to play with and and track what it's been doing what it has done over the past few months so I'd like to thank everybody for coming in tonight and, uh, and joining us and, and learning with us. Uh, do also remember that we have Stars Over Springfield. That happens in person at the museum. That will be the first Friday in April, whose date I forget what it is. Oh, it's April 1st. How can you forget that? Okay, and don't worry, show up at Stars Over Springfield. We will not fool you. You will have a great time. Uh, so, again, uh, thanks to everyone for coming in, and have a great uh, few weeks if we see you at Stars Over Springfield. Otherwise, have a great month, and hopefully we will see you in uh, the April Astro Quest. Have a great night, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Rich. You know, you're welcome. Nice seeing all of you.